A few years ago, God taught me the immense power packed into that little word, and. Do you know in the history of Time of Grace, our media ministry partner, uh, every month pretty much they uh, have this little book that you can get And for the past 18 years, 18 times 12, the number one best-selling book that they have ever had is that one. And I think that little word was the reason why. Is because it challenged all of us. The and asked all of us to change. The and made all of us better Christians. We had to wrestle with people and passages. And the more I think about it, the same thing is true for life. Whether it's dating or marriage or raising kids, whether it's politics or church or work or life in the neighborhood, so much seems to live and die on the inclusion of that little word, and. Anyone can make a one-sided argument. Anyone can tell half the truth. Anyone can dig in their heels based on one little snippet of the evidence. It's only when we include the and that life becomes entirely true and the kind of life that God wants us to have. I've had some of your most frustrating moments at at work or in relationships have been with people who've chosen to tell just half of the story. I lost someone I love. I, I lost my job. She doesn't want to be married anymore. Could be true. And God is with me. And God has a plan for me. And God will never leave me. And God will never forsake me. And nothing can touch the hope that I have in Jesus. Do you see? Like, everything. You, you could focus on that little slice of the truth because the devil would love you to put a period where God would love to see a comma and a conjunction. And. Hope and life and peace and all the stuff that you want and what God wants for you can come down to that little word, and. Which is why starting today and for the next few weeks, I want to jump into this little book of the Bible called Titus. Uh, Titus is super short, three chapters long, 46 total verses. You could read it in under three minutes, but I want to dig deeply into it for the next few weeks. And I want to show you how much life can change when you don't just listen to one part of the story, you add an and and listen to all of it. It says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. A few years ago, there were three Christian songwriters who handed the lyrics of a new song to a popular young artist. And when she read through the lyrics of the song, the emotion gripped her heart and came welling out of her eyes. The lyrics of the song said this, You plead my cause. You right my wrongs. You break my chains. You overcome. You gave your life to give me mine You say that I am free. How can it be? Remember that song? Lauren Daigle's classic hit moved her when she first read the words. And I hope it moves you to think about the words too. God. How can it be that he would elect you? God was perfectly fine and yet he chose to be with you. God is God so he could see all the future at the same time. He could see everything wrong you would ever do in your entire life and yet what did he do? He elected. He chose. Some of you haven't gotten chosen for a date or a promotion or a job or much of anything but all of us through Jesus can say that we are God's elect. So agree or disagree, the Bible is about you. Well, yeah, (laughs) this passage says that God actually picked you to believe in him and spend forever in his presence. And there's verse 2. Paul continues, 
in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. Did you know that let there be light was not the first word that God spoke? That's the first thing he said to start time in history here in our universe, but apparently before he said that, he said, I pick you. <laughs> That's crazy to me. If, if the Father, Son, and Spirit had kept a journal, they would have said, before the beginning of time, here's what we did. They picked their people. They, they elected people. Is that crazy to think about before Jesus walked the earth, before there was a David or an Abraham or an Adam or, or an Eve, God was thinking about, about you. <laughs> so agree or disagree, the Bible is about you. <laughs> yeah, my, my goodness, the Bible is written to tell us that we have hope with God. Right? And there's a verse three. You still with me? Verse 3, and which now at his appointed season he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. Oh, I love this verse. Um, you know, if I could be critical of you, y'all are really mean to the word preaching. Preaching has kind of lost its good reputation in our culture, hasn't it? But don't preach at me. Or, he's so preachy. Or, I really like that church. The preacher, he doesn't really preach. <laughs> but I, I think, you know, I'm trying not to be personally offended by all that. Do you know what the word preach actually means in the Bible? It means to repeat what the king said. But when the king says something with a royal decree, it's authoritative and no one can contradict it, and the messenger comes running through the village and he repeats the news. He doesn't share opinions or feelings or his own spin. He just says what the king says. That, in the Bible, is what it means to preach. And according to this verse, you end up in the light through preaching. You end up learning that God elected and chose you. You find the hope of eternal life through preaching. It's not until someone stands up and repeats what King Jesus said that we step out of spiritual darkness and we see life and eternity like God always intended. So what you really should be thinking as you sit there right now is, Pastor Mike, preach. Come on, Pastor, preach at me. Like, I, don't, I don't need your little human opinion. You're 38 years old. That's probably worthless, right? I don't, I don't need you to share your feelings or what you think about God. I need you to preach. Like, I'm, I'm going through life. I'm going through stuff, and I need to hear what King Jesus said. Pastor, I've been busy. I've been running to my job, working crazy hours, raising kids, but we pay you to sit in an office with one book. So what does it say? You tell us. You've been spending time with the king and his decrees all week, so you tell us. You, you preach. You just repeat what he says. <laughs> because if I do, the words of King Jesus give you light and life and hope, and they remind you that you are his chosen people. And, <laughs> there's one last verse for today. Check out verse 4. Paul says to Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. <laughs> is the Bible about you? Well, apparently it's about grace, which is God's undeserved love. You don't deserve it, but you still get it. That's for you. And it's about peace. That means there's no war anymore with God. It's all good with your Father in heaven. You can be whole and complete because you have him. That's for you. It's from God the Father, which means there is a dad who loves you, who wants you, who listens to you, who always has time for you, who's not going to bail on you, reject you, or leave you. That father is for you. And it's from Christ Jesus, our Savior, which means when you think of Jesus, he's not just a judge. He saves, he delivers, he rescues us from the danger 
of sin. You have grace, you have peace, you have a father, you have a savior, so agree or disagree, the Bible's about you. Agree. <laughs> In fact, let me show you, if I put all these verses together, let me go back to my original question. As you look at that, is this passage about you? God's elect, hope, eternal life, promised light through preaching, our Savior, faith, grace, peace, Father, Savior. Is the Bible about you? Yes, it is. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Man, I was, <laughs> I was getting a little bit nervous about that for a second. And, 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 and did you see what else it's about? In fact, did you catch the noun that shows up in this passage more than any of the others? Let me help you. Take a look. God, God's, God, God, God. Five times, four verses. Add in a he, a his, a father, and a savior. And you have a paragraph of the Bible that's filled with not just you, but you and God. In fact, you longtime Christians who have read the Bible before, do you know what the very first verse of this book says? In the beginning, God created. Do you know on the first page of the Bible, through its first 31 verses, the name of God explicitly shows up how many times? 30. God created, God said, God saw, God blessed, God said, God saw, God said, God saw, God said, God saw, God blessed, God read 30 times in 31 verses. Because on the very first page, God wants to make sure that you know that the Bible is a lot about you, but it is primarily about God. So grab a pen, write this down. This is huge for your faith. I want you to know the Bible is about you and God. And however much space you got in that little blank in your bulletin, I want you, like a kid with a crayon, I want you to make those three letters as big as they can be, G-O-D, because it's not even in the scriptures. The Bible is about God. And if you remember that, uh, it will bless and change you in all the right ways. Uh, it's kind of like this. Let's imagine that this grape is planet Earth. There's you listening to me right now. Right? And if you're in Milwaukee, it's down there. If you're watching this on TV in DC, if you're in India, hey, there you are. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Tell me this for a second. Why, when you woke up this morning, weren't you frozen to death? Why could you blink your eyes open and see your pillow, maybe your spouse, maybe that hot cup of coffee? Why is there life and light and hope and warmth on planet Earth? The answer is this. We did it. Nice. We were practicing before church. The answer is because of the sun. Uh, my scale is a little bit off. Do you know the sun is so big that 1.3 million earths could fit inside of it? And it's only because the sun is so massive that its gravitational force is so strong that the earth orbits close enough for life to exist. So you might not have thought about the sun's existence when you woke up this morning, but the reason there was warmth instead of being frozen, the reason there was life instead of death, the reason you can enjoy anything today is not just because earth is so amazing, it's because of the existence of something else. It's because of this that there's an orbit. Without it, it would go flying off into space. Which is a lot like you and God. My fear for you spiritually is that you would forget the most important thing in your existence. That you would think so much about what's going on in your life that you could actually come to church, uh, actually read this book, 
and forget it's about God. See, here's the nice thing about life on earth. If you forget about the sun, you still get its warmth. The hard thing about spiritual life on earth is that if you forget about God, you lose the warmth of his love. I was thinking about that um, the other day. So with Time of Grace, our media ministry partner, we are blessed with an amazing opportunity to speak to so many of you on television, on Instagram, on YouTube. Millions of people uh, engage with our content each month. But because that digital church is so big, I obviously don't get to meet every person face-to-face. I don't get to know them. And so Time of Grace has made up these kind of character profiles of the kind of people who engage with our content. Uh, The other day, I got these sheets of paper. They have a little picture. Here's Tyler. Here's Tara. Here's Tanya. Here's Tiffany. Here's the average TV watcher, the average Instagram user. And they're like all broken down by the average person, you know, what they want, what they desire, what their story is with, with the faith, so that I can read over them and remember all these people on the other side of the camera who will hear this message. Well, each profile has this little section called wants and desires. Uh, based on what we see on people's social media posts, on what they tell us about themselves, the kind of things they request in their prayers when they call a time of grace, we have a whole list of what people want more than anything in the world. And I wrote it down. Let, let me tell you the list. Uh, our Instagram users want to graduate, want to get a good job, want to save money, be good friends, and be independent of their parents. Our YouTube users want to be valued, to be debt-free, to make their parents proud, to find a serious relationship. Other people want to be good parents or grandparents, be healthy, lose weight, have more time for family. They want financial breathing room, a healthier lifestyle, success in business, and more time with their grandkids. And I would say those are great goals and they're really concerning. Because if if you seek after those things in your life, if you put all your mental and spiritual energy into school and graduation and your job and raising kids and your marriage, you could actually get it. But guess what happens without this? You go flying out of orbit And you end up in this place where God doesn't want you to be. And here's how I know that. Because the people who did graduate sometimes don't have hope. And the people who did find a serious relationship aren't as happy as you think. And the people who make 10 times as much money as you do don't have as much peace as you would assume. It turns out, no matter how life looks on earth, without the presence of something bigger like the sun, we go flying off. Which is why Paul's words matter so much. He's teaching us, it's okay to think about life and family and forgiveness. Just make sure you don't forget about the biggest and most important thing of all. So, I'll give this back to my friend Chad. Not bad for a soccer player. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me remind you of this little tip that can help you so powerfully. And God. Students, I'm going to work hard on this test, on my ECTs, on getting into college. And God will be with me no matter where I end up. And God says I have worth and value no matter what the scores end up to be. And God says, I matter to him, whether I get an amazing job or I don't have a job at all. God says, my my life has value, no matter what the world says. Those of you fighting for love and romance, for love and respect, go crazy, you should. The Bible commands us to. Just, Just remember, and God says, that if he stays with me, it's good. And if he wants to leave me, I still have God. It's wonderful when I feel affection in marriage and God promises that no matter what they choose, no no matter if they're able to forgive, I will always have him and he's God. 
I hope it's nothing. I, I hope the treatments work. I hope the chemo goes through. Great prayers. And God says that there's nothing, not sickness, not death, not angels or demons, there's nothing in all of creation that can take away the hope of eternal life that I have in him. Whenever you're worried, whenever you're anxious, whenever you're stressed, whenever you're depressed, the devil has somehow convinced you to put a period and God erases it. And he says, comma, conjunction, and God. And God. Right? There's nothing you can do to me, devil, that will undo the power of these words. And God. It's not some little dinky God with a small G, not the official church God with a capital G. I'm talking caps lock on, G-O-D, my hope, my peace, my joy, my satisfaction, and God is right here. And you cannot take him away. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, he is mine, and that fact will never change. That simple fact, those two little words, will keep you in the orbit of what God calls life. And no matter what happens on your little personal planet, nothing can take you out of it. That's what Mabel believed. I recently heard a story about a guy named Tom who met an elderly woman named Mabel. Um, here's how Tom described their per first interaction. He says, As I walked into the nursing home, I saw an old woman strapped up in a wheelchair. Her empty stare told me that she was blind. The large hearing aid over one ear told me that she was almost deaf. There was a discolored and running sore covering one part of her cheek and it pushed her nose to one side. She drooled constantly. Mabel was 89 and had been bedridden, blind, nearly deaf, and all alone for 25 years. But Tom got to know Mabel through a lot of conversations. And he built enough trust with her that he got to ask her a really honest question and hear her answer. He asked her, Mabel, what do you think about when you sit here? When they wheel you out of the nursing home and you sit there for another day, another month, another year, what do you think about? And Mabel said, I think about my Jesus. I'm kind of old-fashioned, Mabel said to Tom. And some people around here think I'm kind of weird. But I don't care. I'd rather have Jesus. And then old Mabel withdrew on her chin. She broke out into the words of the old song. Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. Jesus is my strength from day to day. Without him, I would fall. Brothers and sisters, how, how can that be? How can you be blind, deaf, and sit in a poor nursing home for two and a half decades and be satisfied? Well, if you remember those two little words, <laughs> what seems impossible to people is absolutely possible with God. So I want you to remember, no matter what you're going through, the best week of the year or the worst, a great financial time or something that's really making you afraid, things amazing at home and relationships, or you have no clue what tomorrow will bring, I want you to make sure the devil does not get to put the period on that sentence. Instead, let God erase it, draw a comma, and end every thought with those powerful words. And God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, without you and without your spirit, we will think of you too little and not often enough. But with your help, Heavenly Father, we can know you. We can seek you today until we see you. Heavenly Father, with every good thing that we experience in life, every great moment, every cup of coffee, every good meal, we could think of how glorious you must be if you're better than everything. And so we ask you, Father, for help. Open our eyes to see your glory. Help us to be amazed by your presence so that all the things of this earth would seem so small in comparison to you, the sun that we orbit around. 
It's crazy, Jesus, that you gave us the hope of eternal life. You chose us before the beginning of time and in time you died on the cross. In time you sent someone to preach to us that we could hear that the King of kings and Lord of lords chose us. We love you for it and we want to seek you because of it. Bless us today with great faith. We ask this for your glory and for our good. And we pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Did you know that you can experience the joy of God's presence every single day? It's true. The reason that Jesus lived for you and died for you and rose from the grave for you is not just so that you can go to heaven one day, but so that in this very moment, these three powerful words would be true. God is here. Those are my favorite three words in the whole world. That no matter what I'm going through, no matter what you're going through, that God is here and that God is with us. And that's why I would love to tell you so much more in this book that I recently wrote called Three Words That Will Change Your Life. I might have just spoiled those three words. God is here. And in this book, you're going to learn what that means and why it matters so much for your day-to-day -day life. I would love to send you this book as a thank you for your best gift. And for a gift of $50 or more, I would love to include this. This is a brand new companion resource to three words entitled this. <laughs> this is just a, a one word concept that shows you how to seek and see God in the day-to-day -day moments of life. You'll see amazing pictures that I experienced in my life in friendship and with family with food and in nature, all these glorious ways that I could see a glorious God. My prayer is that through these two books, you can see God, know him and love him so that these three words would change your life too. That God is here. Request your copies when you give by calling 800-661-3311, visit timeofgrace.org, write us at P.O. Box 301, Milwaukee, Wisconsin 53201, or text TIME to 313131 to give today. Time of Grace doesn't end here. We offer so much more. Visit us at timeofgrace.org. You'll discover resources to help you in your walk of faith. These include blogs, Grace Moments devotions, and our daily video devotionals. Connect with us on social media. Join our Facebook group where you'll meet a strong community of believers. Follow us on Instagram and get an inside look at our ministry. And if you need someone to pray for you, call us or submit a prayer request. Thank you so much for your support. We'll see you here again next week.